thermodynamics is widely there, very has a very wide scope, and it is there in many applications of physical chemistry. And nowadays, since in many colleges you do not have physical chemistry teachers, you may not have teachers from other uh, will need to take the burden. So, <clears throat> and they may have to teach thermodynamics. So that's why uh, I have chosen this topic. Uh, I think it will be useful to all of you. Okay. So first point is there are, there are certain aspects which are important before the introduction of thermodynamics. Uh, first of all, we talk about this it is equilibrium thermodynamics. So that, that is very important because <clears throat> uh, some people have the uh, notion that thermodynamics, there is a corresponding thermostatic and so on. But, uh, that's a misnomer. This thermodynamics comes from the power, that is dynamo, is the power of heat, is the thermo part. So it means the power of and this is equilibrium thermodynamics because we talk about states which are at equilibrium. <laughs> so <clears throat> probably uh, we will have more discussion on it uh, a bit later. And this thermodynamics is totally based on practical experience. So, so there are laws which are never Thing to be violated in practice. It's a macroscopic law. So, mm, so you have a system containing many particles uh, of the order of Avogadro number of particles, and then <coughs> thermodynamics. Uh, actually, it is uh, full glory. And here are Particularly, two books very important. Castellan is an old book, actually. We were taught uh, from this book. And Levine is a modern book. Uh, these are just examples. There are many other books which you can consult. Denbai is another very old book, The Principles of Chemical Equilibrium. So, it's also a very good book. But there are many, many uh, other books available in the market. Well, so first of all, the important points of this, uh, first, you have a system. And the system, there are three types, isolated, closed, and open. Open in the sense of variable composition. That is, some chemical reaction is going on within the system. So in that sense also, it can be open. Uh, it is closed means <coughs> no exchange of matter is occurring there. And isolated means exchange of matter and exchange of heat, both are forbidden. And we have a definition that uh, besides the system, what you have, you, you call it the surroundings. So the system plus surroundings from the universe. These, uh, uh, this will be important during the discussion of the second law. Now, any system at equilibrium, as we said, that it is equilibrium thermodynamics. So, systems must be, there are states of systems, but those states are at equilibrium. And equilibrium is defined by properties that do not change with time. So, this is the definition of equilibrium, that there has to be properties which do not change with time. And of these, these three are the standard thermodynamic coordinates or variables, PVT. Pressure and temperature, they define actually the average properties. The volume is the volume of the container that you can measure. There are very accurate measures of volume. So volume is not an average property, but pressure and temperature, they are average properties. So usual measures. And properties, you can also <coughs> define properties in terms of intensive and expensive. Extensive means they are mass dependent, intensive means they are mass independent, like temperature, pressure. Extensive is volume. Okay? 
and there are functions which are introduced in thermodynamics which are called state functions they are often very abstract unless you go over to uh, statistical thermodynamics you will see that these <coughs> functions do not have really in the sense okay. but state functions versus path functions path functions this this will be important during the discussion of short form second laws path functions are heat and work the state functions are the thermodynamic functions these are also the state functions and the state function is defined by this relation that it's integral over a cycle that is if we start from one point and complete a full cycle then this integral over dx will be equal to zero and then you call x is a state function okay we shall see some examples okay next comes processes there are processes like isothermal adiabatic isentropic isobaric isenthalpic and so on there is also a process called a free expansion is very cunning uh, type of expansion uh, to do problems and so on so this is very different free expansion and the processes these types of processes can also be classified in terms of two very fundamental uh, concepts one is the case of a reversible process the other is irreversible and normally it is said that reversible processes will take infinite time but irreversible processes are very quick uh, it's not always okay there is another you will find in some books uh, these are called quasi static processes uh, they basically mean this we shall uh, discuss that what we what we uh, are taught in uh, calculus integration is the limit of a sum so quasi static process is based on such an idea and as just i told the reversible process do not always take in finite time like phase transition the phase transition is isothermal and isobaric and you know that a phase transition occurs within a finite time we have done experiment in organic chemistry uh, with a sample of a solid and we determine the melting point so we see that it melts within a finite time finite amount of solid at standard uh, atmospheric pressure and at the temperature of the bath there is a heat bath this is basically a reversible process so it occurs within a finite time say within uh, three to four minutes you complete one uh, particular degree Uh, so, so it is not true that all reversible processes will require infinite time. Okay. So there is another definition of the reversible process that if you reverse the process, the heat and work terms are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. They will come up, and then you have to check whether that is a feasible process. This check you can do via the second law. We shall discuss. so so these are about these are the fundamentals that there are certain processes there are certain systems and so on so now we come to the laws so laws 0 and 1 the zero eighth law there is a zero eighth law and whenever we discuss about laws first we we consider pure systems that is one phase in internal equilibrium so that's because we talk of equilibrium thermodynamics okay so the zero eighth law is the thermal equilibrium condition so it actually determines whether heat will flow from one body to another Exper our experience says that actually heat flows from a hotter to a colder body so a, this hotter what is the definition of hotter or what is the definition of colder how do how do you distinguish so that is uh, determined by temperature and this was introduced much later by even shah okay magna shah uh, indian astrophysicist so on so this is the zero eighth law 
the first law is uh, says about energy conservation this energy conservation including system and surroundings plus more importantly the first law gives you a state function for the first time u okay. this temperature is also a state function but the temperature actually coincides with the ideal gas uh, thermometer temperature so that's why the kelvin scale so uh, we do not uh, bother much about this t it was known to us empirically at least but this is something which uh, uh, which does not have a, any any ready physical interpretation this is called a state function this is u the internal energy and this is provided by the first law in this form that this is the infinitesimal heat change and there is a cross because it's a path function it's equal to the change in internal energy plus an infinitesimal amount of work work is also a path function as i said so that's why there is a cross now if we take an integral over a cycle so that means if we uh, go from one point and come back to the same point so that then it means that integral whole integral over a cycle the q will be equal to integral over a cycle dw because this is a state function and state function by definition as i said that integral over a cycle du should be zero any state function is defined in that way right and this work has two part that is uh, uh, is usually forgotten but it has two parts one is the mechanical work the other is the non mechanical work n m non mechanical this m stands for mechanical so work contains usually two parts so it says the law one it says a, you get a state function which is abstract as a difference of two path function work and heat work and heat both can be experienced in practice and you get a change in something called the internal energy but which you do not know really what is internal energy this cyclic integral shows conservation of energy that is the total amount of heat is equal to the net amount of work so <clears throat> this is energy conservation okay now for an adiabatic process q is zero the adiabatic process is defined in that way q is zero so work becomes a state function because you see that this since q is zero so dq infinitesimal uh, heat is also zero so dw becomes minus of du u is a state function so now the work becomes a function delta g is zero and there is no non mechanical work then heat becomes a state function okay because this is also easy easily seen because this work has mechanical part non mechanical part the non mechanical part is if it is zero then it has only mechanical part the mechanical part of work is integral p dv but there is no change in volume so that disappears so you have heat is equal to the the heat uh, given to the system or heat uh, taken by the system or heat released by the system is equal to the change in the internal energy so now heat becomes equal to a state function so what can heat they can also act as state functions under very special circumstances uh here uh, one point is important that we stick to the older convention older convention convention that was there in our times that this change in internal energy is q minus w so this equation is written in that way q is du plus dw <coughs> heat, heat absorbed is positive work done by the system is positive this is very important these two points and uh, as i said about the books for example castellan uses this uh, convention this is older convention but older and newer convention i am coming just coming to that uh, there is a, there is very little difference this work, only the work done by the system is positive here work done on the system will be positive okay so 
W is forgotten on the system. So naturally, there will be a plus sign instead of this minus. This means basically, from older system to the newer system, if you like to go, you just put for W a minus W. Okay. So everything else remains the same. So you, you may not really bother that much on this convention, but once you stick to a book, uh, you have to follow a particular convention. Okay. Going from one book to another, these uh, Levine, they, they, they actually uh, use the modern convention, this is the current convention. But if you, from Levine, if you go to Kessler and you cross check, you will see that there will be a change of sign. But uh, don't bother about that. It is the positive work in older system is negative work in newer system. So this is the only difference. Now, one or two important points. First is that this mechanical work is a path function. This you can easily demonstrate. I'm just starting to demonstrate. And another point is this, that reversible work is always greater. This is also easy to demonstrate. So let us, so we are now within zero eighth and first law. Okay. Uh, so we shall demonstrate. Uh, now, another point is this, that PV, product of pressure and volume, is also a state function. Okay? Because if you go from one state 1 to state 2, T of PV you integrate, it becomes P2, V2 minus P1, P1. Integral dx is x2 minus x1, 1 to 2. It is a definite integral. So, it is upper limit minus the lower limit value. Now, if we take the cyclic integral, so it, we go from 1 to 2, and then we go from 2 to 1 back. So, 1 to 2 plus 2 to 1. So, naturally, the changes will cancel because this gives you P2 V2 minus P1. This gives you plus P1 V1 minus P2 V2. So, naturally, it becomes 0. So, that, there comes another state function, H, which is U plus V V. U is a state function. PV, we just we have just shown that is a state function. So you can always <coughs> get another state function by using U plus PV. And this is widely used in thermochemistry, uh, the Hess's law, uh, heat of reaction, and so on. So the whole of thermochemistry is based on H, and H is obtained in this way. So basically, we get U and H from the first law. So these two are two state function. Okay. Uh, you may ask, what about u minus p? That might have been a state function as, as well. Uh, u minus p is really another state function, but not useful. Okay. We shall talk about uh, it later, uh, that there are some state functions which are useful, some state functions which are not useful. u plus minus vt, vt you see that this is also a state function. Pt is also a state function. But here you have a mismatch on the dimension. This is the dimension of energy. But V times T does not have the same dimension of energy. Pt similarly does not have the dimension of energy. But Pv has the dimension of energy. So you plus Pv, you get. But you minus Pv, you don't get. Uh, you don't use in thermodynamics. Why? Uh, we shall see later. So, I am posing a few questions uh, which maybe uh, I shall uh, cover today or tomorrow. Now, see that we said about reversible work and irreversible work. We said that reversibly, you get, if you do the work reversibly, you get maximum work. So, irreversible work will be less. And we talked about non-equilibrium states and equilibrium states and said that thermodynamics only applies for states in equilibrium. So let us check a few of this. We said that mechanical work is a path function and reversible work is greater. Uh, we just said it earlier. So let us see. Uh, so it's okay. Everything is okay about everybody. You can... You can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. thank you. So, 
we first discuss the isothermal process and what okay. so this is the isothermal process the reversible curve is black you see that this is pressure this is the volume axis along the x axis so you see that this is a rectangular hyperbola obeying boyle's law because this is an isotherm isothermal work so it's an isotherm and you see that when you cover the whole area in the pv curve this is the volume so pv curve the whole area the, the whole area means the covering the whole of it which is below this uh, black line so that is the reversible work now let us suppose that we are doing the same process we are going from this point to this point and we go irreversibly one step irreversible so that is a red line so from here you straight you have a pressure this final pressure is 0.1 so you basically you are expanding the gas isothermally but with a pressure of 0.1 so naturally you will have just this much of area okay so this is 2 to 10 means 8 and this is 0 to 0.1 so 0.1 into 8 so this is the area now if it becomes a two step irreversible process this is uh, shown here by blue lines so you see that there is one step at at the volume goes from 2 to 10 so at the midpoint you have selected a midpoint but the volume is 6 the corresponding pressure you can get it it is 1.67 or something uh, 0.167 or something so uh, here so you expand up to this point with this pressure then you suddenly reduce the pressure you, you are going irreversibly so suddenly there is a sudden uh, uh, point in irreversible process so suddenly reduce the pressure and then allow the gas to expand up to this point so naturally you now cover this area also so in case of one step irreversible you had just this area now you have this extra area but you don't have this part of area or this part of area you do not have so naturally reversible work remains greater and this reversible work in two steps you will get the area it's 4 in po- into 0.166 plus 4 into 0.1 because the difference is 6 and it is 0.166 so this rectangle plus this rectangle the smaller rectangle okay So six to ten, it is four units, and this is point one zero to point one, so point one into four. So you see that in the reversible curve, you get the maximum work. In one step reversible curve, you get the minimum work, basically. As you increase the number of steps, you are actually increasing the work. Okay. So finally, area increases as steps increase. Finally, quasi static means when you you just go over to just not to then you do a 4 then 8 then 16 and so on it, there are infinitesimal increments and infinite number of steps so naturally you cover the whole area so that is the idea of integration as the limit of a sum so that's that's how you get a quasi static process so in some books you will find that quasi static and reversible they are used exchangeably uh, uh, that's not quite true but anyway uh, it goes like that now we come to free expansion so you see that everything uh, we are we are within zero at and first law free expansion and work so this is a very important point uh, to to uh, highlight a non equilibrium so free expansion you go from a to b a to b so this a point was there p expansion so naturally again zero pressure so pressure is zero here okay pressure is zero here so naturally if there is no area involved so you can see pressure is zero so there is a delta v volume changes from this point to this point but the opposing pressure is zero so naturally it does no work so no work so b is now a non equilibrium state and it settles at c why it is non equilibrium state because this b point you see that pressure is zero volume is finite 
if he is nrt we are talking about say an ideal gas okay so temperature is zero so it cannot be a state you do not have a state with uh, temperature zero pressure zero and so on so basically what happens is that instantaneously from this point the gas actually equilibrates itself it goes on equilibrating itself and it goes over to point c settles there that is the equilibrium point right so that's how this uh, p expansion it shows that from a non equilibrium state you, you really uh, you will go to a uh, to an equilibrium state and since <clears throat> this process here w is zero q is zero because it's a sudden uh, expansion so in in any sudden expansion process you do not have a, have any heat change it, it it does not have the required time to get some heat okay so it cannot get any heat so since w is zero q is zero so naturally delta u becomes zero and if it is an ideal gas u is a function of temperature only so naturally when delta u is zero so there is no temperature change so so basically this from point b you go over not to any arbitrary point c you go over to a point c which can be connected reversibly from a by an isothermal path that is very important because to calculate any change for this free expansion process you any change of any state function you will need this reversible path okay so that's how so a non equilibrium state you go over to an equilibrium state and since the temperature does not change it lies on the boyle's law curve so from here you draw a boyle's law curve from here you draw a straight line you connect and the intersection point will give you the uh, equilibrium uh, equilibrium uh, state of the gas right now let us come back to the adiabatic you see we we have not yet introduced the second law everything is now going over to the first law the one step irreversible adiabatic now this is very important because of some extra reason because we had already discussed the uh, isothermal case one step or two step irreversible isothermal case but now we are coming back to the adiabatic case okay so there is a reversible adiabatic which is a to b okay now suppose <laughs> irreversible adiabatic a to b again we get a non equilibrium so so here it means that from point a this is reversible okay this is the reversible curve you go over to point b but if you do the same thing as a one step irreversible process this final pressure so this is the final pressure at point b so you basically expand the gas against the final pressure so naturally this is the irreversible work okay pressure volume this is the pressure volume curve this is the area under the curve so this gives you the integral pdv so that means the irreversible work now in the reversible case you have the extra work which which you cannot do irreversibly this is a one step irreversible okay so not only that so we have already seen that in the isothermal case the reversible work is greater than uh, say two step or four step reversible process uh, so every where you you are losing some area here also you you are losing some area but not only that there is some extra uh, there is an extra notion uh, see irreversible adiabatic a to b so it it reaches at a point b but it, it does not stand there again this is a non equilibrium point so it goes over along this line to a point c point point to c this is the final point because t is lower at point b temperature is lower at point b this is adiabatically you are going temperature pressure is lower at point b so naturally temperature in the irreversible case in the irreversible case you have done less work 
Now, <clears throat> since the process is adiabatic, so there is no heat change. So this is done at the expense of internal energy. So the internal energy reduction, okay, the system does work. So at the internal energy, so internal energy reduction is actually less because less work is done. So if internal energy reduction is less, so that means the temperature drop will be less. So the drop will be less. So naturally, that, that means the temperature will increase. Now, for a fixed final volume, if the pressure increases, the temperature will increase. So naturally, it will increase. It will increase and settle at point C. So again, in an adiabatic expansion also, adiabatic irreversible expansion, you have the concept of a non-equilibrium point. So, so that means the lesson is this, that from a starting state to a targeted final state, you can go irreversibly via an isothermal process, but you cannot go irreversibly via an adiabatic process because the final state will change. So you have seen just in it here that in the, in the uh, earlier isothermal case, in the earlier isothermal case, you see that you go over to this point, you can go, okay? be it reversible or irreversible, you can go from the starting initial state to a given final state. But you cannot go in the adiabatic case. So from starting state to a given final state B, but that given final state does will be a non-equilibrium state when, when you, you go uh, irreversibly and naturally it will settle at a higher pressure at a higher temperature. Okay. So <clears throat> consider an irreversible adiabatic expansion. Less work, as I said, yeah, I just said it. Less work is done in the irreversible thing. Work is done at the expense of internal energy. So internal energy decreases less and temperature decreases less. So pressure decreases less. So naturally, pressure will increase. For a fixed final volume, this means we are at a higher pressure region, as I just showed here. So we are at a, from here, we are at a higher pressure or higher temperature region. Right. The volume change is fixed. Huh. The equivalent reversible path idea is otherwise very useful, as we uh, just discussed about the free expansion case. So how do you calculate any delta x for a free expansion? So you go along the isothermal path, as I uh, just showed uh, a few uh, slides earlier. So uh, you, you calculate everything via this reversal, uh, via this path. So when, when you do everything in a free expansion, and you need to calculate the thermodynamic changes in thermodynamic properties, you just draw an isothermal line and then you calculate the final uh, the change in the value. Right. The important point is this, that any two points in the PV diagram can be connected by a reversible isotherm and a reversible adapter. This is a lesson from Carnot cycle. Carnot cycle can be taught uh, after the first law for the ideal question. Okay. So, right. <laughs> so, now uh, this uh, more or less covers what is there in the first law. Uh, I just uh, didn't discuss about thermochemistry. Okay. Thermochemistry does not involve any new law, uh, it is just an application of uh, H, delta H. So, now we come to the second law. So, in the second law, you again find a new state function. Like in the first law, you, you got u and later h. So here, you basically get a state function s. s is called the entropy that satisfies ds, any infinitesimal change in s is infinitesimal <coughs> change in heat, the reversible. This is very important. This subscript reversal is very important. Why temperature if the temperature remains constant? So this is the definition of Ds. 
and ds of the universe is greater or equal to zero. Any change of the universe, universe as I said, that universe is system plus surrounding. So this is greater equal to greater is for a reversal equal to is for the reversible case. Hmm. Or you can say that the delta s universe is greater or equal to zero. Okay? And during the discussion of the second law, you need to note that a reservoir, usually you talk of a reservoir, <coughs> means there is a source. Source is at a higher temperature, there is a sink which is at a lower temperature. And reservoir is always infinite. So the reservoir takes up or releases heat reversible. So when we apply this relation to a reservoir, means a source or a sink, we just apply straightforwardly without uh, being concerned about the reversibility nature because it is always reversible. Okay? Now suppose heat is taken up by the system from the surrounding. Okay? So what is the change in entropy of the surroundings? The DA surroundings is minus dq by d. It is taken up by the system. So naturally from the surroundings some heat is given to the system. Surroundings loses heat. So it is minus and surroundings or surroundings it's reversible, you need not write, as I just said, so minus dq by And ds universe is surroundings plus change in entropy of the system, so it is ds system, and ds surroundings is minus dq by t, and this has to be greater or equal to zero by the definition of the first law, hey, second law, sorry, second law. So this means that change in entropy of the system, it is either greater or equal to the Q by T. And this equality holds for reversible case. Okay? So this is very important again, because whenever there is an adiabatic process, you normally uh, mean that adiabatic <coughs> process, there is no heat change, so naturally Q is zero, so naturally delta S will be zero. It's not true. So this is a tricky uh, matter. And it, it requires some explanation. I shall uh, come to the explanation. Now, there are usually statements of the second law. One is the Kelvin Planck statement. Okay. The Kelvin Planck statement says that in a cyclic of processes, it is impossible to transfer heat from a heat reservoir and convert it all into work without at the same time transferring a certain amount of heat from a hotter to a colder body. So there is a cyclic process. You transfer heat from a heat reservoir and convert it all into work. This, it says that this is impossible without transferring a certain amount from a hotter to a colder body. Okay? And there is another statement, which is a Clausius statement. Clausius statement, Clausius actually formulated the second law in the standard form, <coughs> actually defined the term entropy and so on. The Clausius statement is that it is impossible that at the end of a cycle of changes, heat has been transferred from a colder to a hotter body without at the same time converting a some certain amount of work into heat. So that means without doing any work from a colder to a hotter body, uh, heat cannot go, right? Uh, which is our normal experience, it cannot go by itself. So you see that in both the cases, you are using a cyclic process. So cyclic process means the delta S of the system is zero, be it reversible or irreversible. Because in whichever way you do the transformation, since you are coming back to the earlier point, to the starting point, since you are coming back, so any change any change of thermodynamic properties, any thermodynamic property will be zero, right? So delta S of the system is zero. So to apply, to see that whether this Kelvin or Kelvin Planck, is sometimes called a Kelvin Planck statement also, uh, or the Clausius statement, whether they are in conformity with what we discuss, to see the equivalence, uh, check the equivalence, so we, we consider the functioning of engine and a refrigerator. Because refrigerator, because we need the Clausius statement 
an engine. This is about an engine, heat reservoir and convert it into what? So you you are taking heat from a reservoir and trying to you are trying to convert it into what? All into what? And here here heat is being transferred from a colder to a hotter body. So naturally this refers to a refrigerator. So this is an engine. You are at a higher temperature. This is the source. You take some amount of heat Q1. You do some work W, and then some amount of heat you actually put to the sink, which is at a lower temperature. So this is the normal functioning of an engine, and this is the normal functioning of a refrigerator. Uh, uh, normal, uh, okay, within quote unquote normal because. This is a reversible engine. This, this is also a reversible refrigerator. That's how we just uh, altered the sign, uh, altered the, this, the uh, arrow heads, actually. So, so these takes up from the holder reservoir some amount of heat. Some amount of what is done on the system. The system is cyclic. And then it actually gives you some heat one amount of it to the source. So from a colder reservoir going to a hotter reservoir, Clausius statement states that without doing any work, you cannot do it. And Kelvin's tank statement says that if you, you cannot convert the whole of Q1 into W and give here zero. Okay, so let us check. Okay, energy is conserved everywhere. Because here Q1 is equal to W plus Q2. And here Q2 plus W gives you Q1. So there is no uh, violation of energy conservation. A energy conservation cannot, can never be violated also. But that's how actually we are going beyond the first law. So the first law was talking about energy conservation. But now we see that even maintaining the energy conservation, you cannot do certain things. Like one is this, that irreversible engines can't be reversed. Okay? But uh, for simplicity, I'm talking about a reversible engine first. So let us now note the Kelvin Planck statement, delta S of the universe. So, so you are taking Q1 amount of it, converts it fully into what? And you see if here, you, you transfer basically zero amount of it. So naturally, the source, for the source you have, an entropy change which is minus q1 by q1. For the sink, there is no change because you give zero. For the system, there is no change. System is cyclic. So delta s of the system is zero. So delta s of the universe now becomes minus q1 by q1. But delta s of the universe, we, 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 we stated in the very definition of second law. That that's how we define the second law. That it can never be negative. It will be zero or positive. Delta S of the universe. So naturally, here it turns out to be negative, so it is impossible. So naturally, nothing goes to the sink. Uh, this, you, you cannot do it. You cannot do it. So Kelvin Planck statement, what it says is true, that if nothing goes to the sink, you cannot have an engine operating uh, rightly. Now, <coughs> we come to the Clausius statement. Clausius statement, in Clausius statement, we say that from here, from the holder reservoir, you are taking some amount of it, which is Q2. You, you apply no work here. So, you straight just through this uh, cycle, you just transfer this amount of it into Q1. So, naturally, since W is 0, so Q2 will remain Q2 here. So, what is the entropy change of this thing? It will be minus Q2 by T2. What is the entropy change of the source? It is being added there. So, naturally, it will be plus. It is Q1 by T1, but Q1 is Q2. So, plus Q2 by T1. Okay? So, delta S of the universe will be minus Q2 by T2 plus Q2 by T2. But you see that Q1 is at a higher temperature. So naturally, it will be less. 
Q2 is the same. So at the denominator, if you have a higher number at the denominator, you will have a lower positive contribution and you will have a higher negative contribution because this is lower than Q1. So again, it becomes negative and you, you cannot transfer in this way any heat from a colder to a hotter body without doing any work. And no work is done, W is zero, cyclic system, so delta S system is always zero. Here also delta S system is zero, so delta S universe is the entropy change of the uh, source and the sink. Here also entropy change of the source and the sink. So conservation of energy is nowhere violated. So you see now that the second law really states something more. That's very important. Okay. So we shall. Uh, so uh, now, now if you just uh, try to uh, summarize it, that after the first law, if you take the ideal gas, you can do an isothermal expansion at T1, taking T1 from the source, adiabatic expansion from T1 to T2, which is a standard textbook graph, then isothermal compression at T2, draining heat Q2 to the sink, and then an adiabatic compression from T2 to Q1. Energy conservation holds, you get eta. Eta is the efficiency, which is work done by amount of heat taken from the source. So it is 1 minus Q2 by W is Q1 minus Q2. So it is 1 minus Q2 by Q1, and this becomes equal to 1 minus Q2 by Q1 also. So in this way, for the ideal gas, after the first law, you can do a Carnot cycle. Uh, you can teach, really, a Carnot cycle, but with an ideal gas. But what you cannot do is this. What, wh where comes the second law and its importance? That after the second law, there is no reference to working substance. You need not take an ideal gas. Okay? You can still get this derivation. And you get also this inequality. In the first law, you just uh, uh, recall, in the first law, there is no inequality. But in the second law, you have an inequality uh, concerning delta S universe. It is greater or equal to zero. So in, in that way, you get that this efficiency of a reversible engine is greater than the efficiency of an irreversible engine. It's very general. So... <clears throat> This is the basic difference regarding Carnot cycle. Since the Carnot cycle is, is, lies at the heart of thermodynamics, so Carnot cycle you can teach after the first law. You can also teach after the second law, uh, but that is more profitable because uh, you gain certain things more. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I am just. Uh, uh, I will be permitted to take a break for a few minutes, just a few minutes, okay? Uh, three to five. Uh, concretization of things, that for any working substance, reversible engine, which we call Carnot engine, these are uh, used exchangeably. The reversible engine is Carnot engine, a reversible refrigerator is Carnot refrigerator. So delta S universe will be zero as required by reversibility and second law, as I uh, just said. And delta S universe becomes equal to Q2 by T2, since some heat is given to the sink, Q2 amount of heat, and the sink is at temperature T2, and sink accepts everything reversibly. So it is Q2 by T2 minus Q1 by T1, because from the source, heat is driven out. So naturally, it will be negative, minus Q1 by T1. The source is at a temperature T1, and W is defined by Q1 minus Q2. This is the conservation of energy. And eta the efficiency of the engine is W by Q1, so is the definition of eta. This whole of heat cannot be comfort, uh, converted into work. So that means eta is always less than 1. Okay. But this, for a reversible engine, this is the maximum possible efficiency because delta S universe here was chosen equal to 0. Okay. So this is how you show that eta is maximum and eta is greater than any irreversible engine. Because for any irreversible engine, delta S universe will be greater than this. Okay? Heat Q1 can't be completely converted into work. Heat Q1, is it, 
it is normally stated in books that heat cannot be completely converted into work. That's not true. Heat Q1, the heat abstracted from the uh, source cannot be completely converted into work. That is the true statement. Okay? Heat can be, uh, cannot be because there is energy conservation. So, so that's why this W appears here, W is Q1 minus Q. Okay? But you see that heat Q1 cannot be completely converted into W, while W can be completely converted convertible into heat. Okay? Check the refrigerator case. Okay? Refrigerator case, we have just uh, seen. Uh, you see that here, this work which we do on the system, the system goes reversibly, uh, goes cyclically, but whatever work we do, Q2 plus W becomes equal to Q1. So W is completely convertible into heat. So work can be completely converted into heat, but it cannot be completely converted into work. So that is the important point. And here we will see that the coefficient of performance, coefficient of performance, I shall define in the probably in the tomorrow's class. So um, for the refrigerator, like here, eta, we have the efficiency of an engine, this is the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator. This is phi, and this phi is less than phi reversible. Like the fact that eta is less than eta reversible. Okay. And from second law, since you have in the second law, you have defined S. From the first law, you have defined U. You can define at least two new state functions which are useful. Uh, why not others? Because these are useful. And useful and useless state functions will, will uh, concern us later. Now you see that for an irreversible engine, you have this. Here, delta is universe is zero. So Q2 by T2 equal to Q1 by T1. But irreversible, it will be greater. So Q2 by T2 will be greater than Q1 by T1. Okay. So it is greater than this. And for an irreversible refrigerator, you have this Q1 by T1. This is the, actually, this is positive and this is negative. So this is less than zero. So uh, to, uh, uh, to have the parity with the earlier uh, expression, uh, I uh, have here the Q2 by T2 minus Q1 by T1, but then it has to be less than zero. Now, there is another part of the second law, which is called the Kara Theodore principle. It says that in the neighborhood of any arbitrary initial state J0 of its legal system, there exist neighboring states J, which are not accessible from J0 along adiabatic path. These adiabatic paths may be anything, reversible or irreversible. So let us just uh, concern a bit uh, ourselves about this. This is another statement of the second law. And the next figure shows <coughs> the points around the left of C cannot be connected to B via any adiabatic path. So what is the explanation? Suppose these are the adiabats. Okay? So this is, again, a temperature versus volume curve. Okay? So since this is temperature, these red lines are isothermal lines because temperature is constant along the red line. So suppose from B to C, we have a reversible adiabatic path. Now we shall, we, we, we shall be able to show that any point at the left of C, like a point D, there are infinite such adiabatic paths depending on the starting pressure and volume. Okay? So any point at the left of C, like a point here D, from D, you cannot go to B. Uh, that means, in other words, from B, you cannot go to D via any adiabatic path. Okay? So let us see why. Okay? So consider axis of D or any point to the left of C to B via any adiabatic. So what happens is this, that choose the cycle B, D, A, B. B, D, A, A. Uh, B, D, A, B, okay. Uh, we can choose that, or D, A, B, D. D, A, B, D. Okay. So, from A to B, this is a reversible isothermal volume increases, the reversible isothermal path. 
So heat is taken up by the system to do some work along this line. Now this is an arbitrary adiabatic path, and this is a reversible adiabatic path. So naturally, you can see that in two other paths there is no heat change. So heat change occurs only along this path. Or you can take this uh, part also. Uh, anyway, you will get two adiabatic paths and one isothermal path. But in one isothermal path, we know that heat is completely convertible into work. But here you have a cycle. Okay. If you start from A, A B D A, or A D B A, so you can start from a, you can you can complete a cycle via two adiabatic paths and one. Isothermal path, and along one isothermal path, it is completely convertible into work. Okay, so that means you can get complete work from heat if you consider this cycle, but which is not permissible via a Kelvin Planck statement. It says it says that you cannot do that in a cyclic process. You just take up heat from a high temperature reservoir, convert it into whole into work. You cannot do it. We, we have just seen also that you cannot do it. So this is an impossible cycle. But this is an impossible cycle. So that means this from D to B you cannot go adiabatically. Okay. So that's how the explanation comes. Okay. So it is not permissible by the second law. In other words, you can say that this is a Carrier-Taylor principle is basically defining the second law. That any adiabatic path is not allowed. So now let us summarize. From first law, you get U and then H because PV is a state function. From second law, you get S, A, and G. A and G is the work function, or the Helmholtz free energy is the Gibbs free energy, or plane free energy, or Gibbs potential. The definitions of this that H is U plus PV, A is U minus PS, G is H minus. Now of these, delta A and delta G, these things can be calculated for isothermal processes only. Okay, so that's why they are important during the discussion of chemical reactions which are uh, done at uh, a fixed temperature and so on. So. Changes of U, H, and S determine whether a state has gone to another state. For example, if you have delta U equal to zero, delta H equal to zero, and delta S equal to zero, you you really do not have any process like that. Okay, so that's important. Okay. Now this is the combination of first and second laws. Now I I just posed a few questions like this: that why here you have a plus, why here you have a minus, you don't have a plus. Here you have a minus. You don't have a plus. Why are these and why are these left-hand uh, side functions are useful state functions? Because U is a state function. T S is also a state function. So U plus T S becomes a state function. U minus T S becomes also a state function. But A, the useful part, okay, Helmholtz free energy is defined as U minus T S. They do not define it, it as U plus T S. Or the Gibbs potential, it is H minus T S. It is not defined at H plus T S. Why? Okay. So, so here is the explanation. You see that this is the first law. D U plus D W is D Q, and D Q less equal to T S is the second law, and D W is the P D V part plus non-mechanical part. This is the mechanical part of work. This is the non-mechanical part of work. So now you reorganize. Okay, so du is less equal to TDS minus DW. So DW is PDV minus DW non-mechanical. So you write it in this way. And when you just remove this DW part, it becomes du is less equal to because uh, non-mechanical work you rarely do. You do in case of a cell and uh, one or two other uh, issues there uh, where you use non-mechanical work. Normally we are concerned with. Mechanical work. Okay. So U, you see that in DU you have a DS and a DV. Term. 
So that means U is a function of S and V. So this is how the, it is defined. And del S del U V, del S del U at constant volume system, vanishes so del S del U V is 1 by T. This is a definition of temperature. This is a thermodynamic definition of temperature. But if the entropy increases with the internal energy, then it becomes a positive temperature. Otherwise, it, it can be negative temperature. There, there is a concept of negative temperature for finite systems. Okay. Now, similarly, <coughs> you just try to uh, arrange things in such a way. Uh, for example, D of U plus V. U plus V, D U is this. So naturally, this is less equal to TDS minus PDV minus DW non-mechanical work plus P of PV is PDV plus VD. You add these two, U plus PV. And you can see that the PDV term will cancel. Right? So, so this would not have cancelled if we put here, here a minus sign. So that's why U minus PV, it's a state function, but not a useful state function. So that so this is how you get that D8 is less equal to TDS remains and VDP remains. So TDS plus VDP minus DW non-mechanical. And non-mechanical, if you neglect it, so A it becomes a function of S and P. So this is how here you have a plus and that's useful. You have to note that certain terms should cancel, right? For example, you consider again DA. A is U minus TS, A, A is U minus TS, so D of U minus TS, so DU minus TDS minus SDT. And DU, we have already got, DU is less equal to TDS minus PDV. So TDS <coughs> minus PDV will cancel with this TDS, this is a minus. So you see that if you put a plus here, the TDS term would not have cancelled. So it becomes minus SDT minus PDV, minus there is a non-mechanical work and so we normally say that A is a function of temperature and volume. Similarly, G becomes a function of temperature and pressure. This is more useful because we, we do everything at normal pressure, atmospheric pressure, and in a thermostat, the temperature can remain fixed. So, so that's it. So you can now uh, understand that why this U plus TS or H plus TS, they are not useful state functions because that would not cancel things. So, useful state functions, why? The natural variables are two. There are two natural variables. If you neglect that DW non-mechanical stuff, there are two natural variables. That, that, that is everywhere. And you, you should check the cancellation of stuff. Right. Now, the equations and their interpretation. Uh, so, uh, so, these are the inequalities that we got. Okay. So, uh, uh, we just quickly go over to it. Uh, no, I think that I should, uh, I should not discuss about this. This is not that important. Okay. This is also, I think I should take much more time. Uh, so, the, the, there is an extension to chemical equilibrium. At a closed system with multi-phase, you have basically in all these equations, like du is less equal to whatever you had, along with a positive term like this, that this is mu, this is the chemical potential of the J component in alpha phase, this is the number of moles, the change in the number of moles for the J component in the alpha phase, and there is a sum over alpha. So multi-phase system in uh, uh, with, with number of moles varying, so, so, so a system with variable composition, uh, so far, we are concerned with a, a single phase pure system and so on, as we said at the start, right? Okay. So now we come to the third law. Third law says that in the limit t tends to zero, delta is equal to zero for an isothermal reversible process and pure system is internally. Limit t tending to zero, delta is equal to zero. This is the content of the third law, meaning S is a function of temperature only as t tends to zero. Because delta S or S, as we have seen, that they they actually each, any state function depends on two variables. As I just said, uh, uh, one, one or two uh, slides earlier, that why? So natural variables are two. Right. So, so here you see that when t tends to zero, uh, basically one natural variable actually 
uh, is becomes unimportant. S is a function of temperature on the oxygen. So what are the consequences? And isotherm becomes equal to an adiabat because this is an isothermal process and limit pretends to be delta is equal to zero. But we know that delta is, is zero for a reversible adiabatic process. So a reversible isotherm and a reversible adiabat becomes equal when pretends to zero. That is very important. And from delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S, okay, isothermal process, okay, we get isothermal, so, so there is no S delta theta. Uh, so we get that delta G is equal to delta H when T tends to zero. This tends to zero and this also is zero by the third law. So naturally delta G becomes equal to delta H in the limit state to zero. This was Norm's observation from many experiments. Okay. Okay, Taylor expansion, you did not bother about it, but what we need to uh, bother is that any property like delta G or delta H turns it. It says that if delta G increases, delta H will decrease. So here delta G, here delta H. If here delta H, if delta H increases, then delta G will decrease with temperature and parabolically, not linearly. You see that it's not a linear. It's a parabola. Okay, so that's the content of non street theory. Okay. And next, the last point is the unattainability of zero Kelvin. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we go? Uh, how do we reduce the temperature? So we start with some S and T. We then do an adiabatic reversible, adiabatic reversible expansion. So S given same, T1 goes down to T2. It reduces. It's an expansion, it reduces. Then we do an isothermal reversal. So from S1, you get some S2, but isothermal, so T2 remains same. Then we again do an adiabatic reversal so that we from S2, we get T3. T3 is lower than T2. Okay, so T gradually decreases from T1 to T3. So this is the normal scheme by which we reduce the temperature. But when T2 tends to zero, suppose that... Uh, a meanwhile, at some point, T2 tends to zero. So S1, T2, isothermal reversal, it remains S1, T2 because delta has become zero by definition. So, so the process stops, does not continue because isothermal reversal becomes adiabatic reversal as delta is equal to zero. So any T close to zero Kelvin is attainable, but not zero Kelvin. So it is normally uh, shown in a graph. This is a function, entropy is a function of X and T. This is near T equal to zero. Here you see that when T is zero, T is, T is two. So this is not allowed by the third law. So this curve we, we should not consider. We should instead consider this curve, which is allowed because delta S tends to zero as T tends to zero. This is allowed. Now we consider a, a path like this, that this is how we gradually reduce the temperature. Okay? Now, here you see that as you go down, you see that it requires infinite such steps to, to come to this temperature zero or close to zero. So, so you cannot do it. Here, this is the isothermal path. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is the isothermal because here this is against T. So, T remains constant and this is the adiabatic path. So, adiabatic isothermal, adiabatic isothermal. So, this is how, as we said, you go on, but it requires infinite number of states. So now we come to the summary. Okay, so now everybody should be happy. The summary is there, so naturally it will uh, it will end. So there is a law zero which introduces the temperature, which <coughs> says heat flow, that no heat flow condition is defined by the fixation of temperature. The temperature remains same. Law one, which defines a new uh, function, state function called the internal energy function, has a difference of two path points. Second law, it defines entropy with the property additionally that delta S of the universe should be greater for equal to zero, equal to for reversible, greater for irreversible. It is for the universe, not just for the system. And there is a law three, which says that the behavior defines the behavior of delta S as temperature tends to zero. So these are the laws. Okay. Ah. 
so that's the final one okay so thank you very much uh, so now i invite question hello so now it's a question session so audience can uh, raise questions or uh, comments suggestions whatever you want sorry i i cannot really hear you So it's a question session. So our audience can raise their questions, clarifications, or any comments. Like, 